Welcome to Financial Services and Bank Marketing in a Pandemic with U.S. Bank and Wells Fargo. My name is Eric Newton. I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Milestone, and it is my pleasure to have with me today Brenda Arndt, VP of Content and Search at U.S. Bank, and Brian Wynn, Senior Vice President of Digital Card Acquisition at Wells Fargo. Today's agenda is to start out with a new milestone point of view on Omnichannel. And then Brian's gonna take us in on a fairly, uh, fairly deep dive into his one omni-channel strategy and how they build uh, personas and profiles and how they map the customer journey and the content to it. US Bank and Brenda are gonna tell us about the big pivot they made in marketing uh, uh, around the COVID time in the uh, first couple months of the year and how they put a community and employees first and how important it is for them to use an empathetic branding message and build on what is a consistent part of their, their company identity. And then I'll share with you some new milestone research. Um, all right, so let me start out with this POV. And the POV that I'm gonna share with you is that the internet is a platform everyone uses. So every almost every business is going to have a homepage and a website. This is where we were 15, 20, 25 years ago. This was the basics. Then LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, we find out, are platforms almost everyone uses. So as a business, we have to participate there or we're going to miss communicating with our audience. These are social homepages. So now we've got, we essentially have five homepages if we just count these. Now, YouTube streams more video than Netflix and Facebook combined. So you got to be there also. You need a video presence. So things like this webinar have to be repurposed and shared in that channel because a lot of people, particularly uh, the younger generations, are more inclined to consume video content than uh, traditional text and images. And on you go into Reddit, Quora, SlideShare, Medium, Pinterest, the vertical rating sites that matter in your industry, bankrate.com, uh, Zillow for, for mortgage, Bizarre Voice, Yelp, G2 Crowd, Trust Radius. These are also homepages. So now we're up to 12 or 13 different homepages. These things we think of as channels are actually all distributed versions of your website. Digital content is your website. It's just we think of, we think of them as separate things when in fact they're, they're all interconnected. I'm like what do I mean by interconnected and what does that look like? This is a knowledge graph. And I, I looked for different examples to show you guys. This is a really simple knowledge graph. Uh, looks to me like a Facebook group. It looks to me like a social group with only a, a few dozen people and a couple of activities. Each of the spokes here are some of the popular activities that are clustering on video games and biking. And let me show you what it looks like a little bit more blown up. You can see a little more detail here of, of the knowledge graph. Now, Google indexes all of the content that's visible on the internet and puts it into its knowledge base, which is a giant, it's like, it's something with like 3 billion of these graphs within it, 3 billion facts, the little, the little points, the needle points. And Google's involved in 80% of customer journeys. So what does Google put in the, the knowledge base? Well, uh, let me use a technical term and then I'll explain it. Entities scored by authority. So what's an entity? It's a person, place, or thing that's given meaning and context by facts and links. This is the original premise of Google from 25 years ago, and 20, 25 years ago when they started the company about popularity and context. So then if Google is collecting all this information and so many of the journeys go through there, then Google is the homepage of all your homepages. And this is the publicly available US bank uh, SERPs. And this is, and Wells Fargo has really strong SERPs too, but let me use this one as an example of something that is truly dominant. Um, we've got the knowledge panel, we've got paid, we've got site links, we've got the local three pack. That is the top half of the fold and you can barely get to the first branch. They've got a huge Twitter carousel. They've got Facebook and they've got, they've got this is hard to control. These are people also ask questions that Google controls. And then you go to the second page, they've got YouTube, they've got Twitter again, they've got, there's a Wikipedia entry. And then they've got their mobile site. They've got their mobile distribution on the Google app and the Apple store. This is an incredibly dominant uh, saturation of the SERPs. This is what we recommend all customers try to do. This is why we do content marketing. 
because 80, 65% of the journeys start here in the SERPs, 80 plus percent of the journeys have some, some uh, throughput through these things. Saturating the SERPs is the goal of digital marketing and doing that is thinking about all of these homepages we have to manage together. This is why we care about omni-channel marketing. So how do you do what US Bank did? Now US Bank's been you know, investing heavily in digital marketing for what? Most of 20 years, Brenda, is that about right? Since, since the, really the beginning of the, right. the, the commercial internet. So how do we help Google? How do you do that? Well, you define the entities, you be authoritative and you be popular. So helping Google understand your facts makes it more likely that they'll show your content. Schemas identify and define the entities and the facts uh, Google uses to answer questions from its users. If you think about search, every single search is a question. Every search result is an answer. That's why they call them queries. People are looking, they have a question in their mind. They either type it in a question format or not. But being able to answer questions requires you to the entities to be clear, for you to be a trusted and authoritative source, and for you to be popular and well distributed. This is why there's a lot of demand for people who do what we all do in digital marketing. All right, so your digital content is what represents your entities. We make digital things, like I'm talking about milestone research. That's milestone research is an entity that I'm using to represent milestone as a company, that entity, and that content, and I'm distributing it and repurposing it in multiple forms. That's how I'm helping Google understand the facts that are important to me uh, you know, on the research, which I'll, I'll show you guys after Brenda speaks. So what does omni-channel distribution look like to us? Well, you've got core content like a webinar or a video or an interview or an event. You capture some content or a really good blog or a really good white paper. But you have to be really conscious that you built that asset for the channel, the first channel you launched it into. And it won't work if you just relaunch the same format into a different channel. You got to repurpose it. Maybe it needs to be shorter. Maybe it needs to be pictographic. Maybe it needs to be all of these things you have to, if you're not sensitive and uh, in touch with the channels where you're redistributing this content, these other home pages, you're not formatting for that audience, it won't be well received. And you'll just be doing flat amplification. You have to be doing the adjustment and the amplification for effective omni-channel. And Brian's going to touch a little bit on that in his section. So that's a, that's a prelude and a POV. Uh, at Milestone, we help you organize and amplify your digital information to reach the right audience. We do that with a collection of MarTech software on the left, six, seven products that, that help you get this job done. And omni-channel services on the right, which are traditional digital agency services where depending on how big or small your team is, we add as much service as you need to get the job done. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Brian Wynn. Thanks, Eric. And I can't echo enough the importance of the components that he talked about with um, ensuring that you've got uh, like the right message spread across the, the, the different platforms to ensure you've got a unique and consistent customer experience across the digital ecosystem. Um, and so, uh, you know, as we dive deeply or further a little bit into specifically how we at Wells Fargo think about digital marketing and delivering exceptional omni-channel campaigns, um, spoiler alert, it starts and ends for us with the customer, um, as it should for everyone else. Um, and so on the next slide, I've got um, a bit of a, a content uh, heavy slide here. So I won't read through all of the specific uh, dimensions or components of how we think about um, ensuring that our marketing strategy is connected. Um, but again, focused with, on the customer, these six components of how we define what it, what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it, how will we do it, and the outcome that we expect. Again, um, there is a deep level of um, you know, intent and purpose, and, and, and we kind of obsess about each of these components um, to ensure that we get a solid customer experience that comes out of a, a new campaign or a new marketing program. Um, but I, I will say that um, within each component, we t always take and tie back to uh, the customer, how we will stand out against our competitors um, and how we will uh, specifically, though, meet the needs and the wants of our customers in, um, in an authentic and humanistic way. 
And so the next slide is, um, you know, focusing on our targeted audience. You know, we design um, our target uh, audience um, with a unique perspective of looking at offer differentiation and how will we be relevant from a message perspective and ensuring that we are effective and efficient in reaching consumers in their channel preference. Um, we can design the best product in the world, the best message in the world, um, but looking at that first Chevron, evaluating the scale. And so we do deep analysis on what is the population? What's the demographic of the population? Um, what are their financial services, their wants and needs, and can we profitably meet them? Um, and if so, then how do we further define that in terms of uh, their behavioral and psychographic behaviors? And so we layer on, if you will, so some might assert that demographics are dead, but um, they aren't. They essentially kind of give you an outline of your target. And then for a financial services company, it's incredibly important that we identify that first, but then um, ensure that we layer on their, their psychographic needs. Um, and then are they, do they have attributes that we, are, we can easily kind of parse out and say, yeah, we can target these um, and we can evolve these over time to consistently be relevant and meaningful to our customers. And identifying wants and needs, uh, it's uh, while it appears as though that's kind of a linear step, I think that's an ongoing step because consumers, they go across um, whether they have an interest in a rewards card or cash back card, or maybe they have an interest in a low rate or a balance transfer card. And so different financial needs at different uh, points uh, in, in their lives. And so there is a, a consistent check back in um, leveraging digital insights. Um, whether they be insights that we have on consumers from, you know, on us data or even third party data. So we consistently track back to ensure that um, we understand the interest profiles and, and we tie the deep insights into segment behaviors and so that we can accurately target. Um, and then we ensure that our brand is a fit for the customer wants and needs. We don't want to be disingenuous uh, because that will just lead to not meeting or delivering on the strategy that we defined and, and, and we won't get the business results that we intended. So brand fit is uh, extremely important in terms of segmentation and how we think about ensuring that the offers that we have and the messaging is the, the right tone and is on kind of target for the audience that we're intending to reach. Uh, and over time, we continuously re redefine, refine attributes just to ensure that, again, that over the, the, you know, the, li the consumer's life cycle, that we are incredibly relevant to them. Um, and so this slide, this is an example of, this is where we, I would say we uh, maybe overly obsess on uh, the consumer personas. And so as we break out the segments into different uh, audiences and, and as we think about products and value propositions and offers for consumers and rewards, this is just one example of a persona of a consumer that we've identified that meets more of a, uh, a travel points enthusiast. And so um, this customer persona, this is Olivia Johnson. She's a 37 year old working mother with two small children. She's an IT uh, analyst and she lives in the, in the Northeast in Princeton, New Jersey. And, and from a travel perspective, she's got two family vacations. Uh, you know, there's four or, you know, several work related trips. And so there's an opportunity for her to earn loyalty, uh, you know, either at hotel stays or airline stays. And she's got the occasional friends weekend trip as well. And so as we think about her needs from a product perspective, we take her, her profile into super deep consideration. Um, and then from a banking product perspective, she's got a checking account, a debit card, and she's um, a home mortgage customer. So she just happens to be traveling from uh, uh, work to home one day. And she's, you know, after a long days of work, she's thinking, wow, I really need a vacation. Um, you know, and, and she's hoping to get one planned in the midst of her busy life between, you know, demanding job and demanding home life. And, uh, you know, a, a trip to the Caribbean would be amazing for her, just a, a little bit of a getaway. And she's thinking about ways to partic 
a, you know, fund that vacation. And one thing that she's aware of kind of high level is that there are rewards cards out there that could enable uh, that travel experience. And so she goes to the Points Guys website. So essentially, um, and if you go to the, the next slide, Gaurav, you'll see that the the consumer learning journey, as Eric was alluding to, starts in third party digital. So, you know, it is in, in incredibly important that we show up and we are relevant in the channels where customers start their shopping journey, where they start to compare and contrast um, us as a card issuer to the competitive landscape that's out there. And so... Um, it is incredibly important that we are where consumers are just starting to learn. So we want to build that broad awareness. And so Olivia visits a third party website called the Point Sky. And, and many of you may have heard of this popular website. Um, it's where there's lots of content about how to best travel, uh, cards that enable th that travel and the value propositions and how to get the most value out of those cards. And so she stumbles upon our product that's out there, the uh, Wells Fargo Propel card, uh, which she finds very interesting. So she clicks through to get to our landing page to consume more information. Um, but as she's uh, getting to her stop, she kind of stops her learning journey at that point. Um, but she remembers she's she's got Wells Fargo Propel card in her brain. Um, and so later on, she actually comes to our website remembering that, oh, yeah, there was an offer that was, or there's a product that was out there that's interesting to me. I mean, so on the next slide, you'll see how we tie her third-party kind of learning experience in that we know that she arrived on our landing page. And so we work to ensure that we are connecting all digital touch points, leveraging uh, available MarTech in the latest and greatest kind of digital analytics tools. And so once we connect that, um, Olivia, or this consumer in particular, not at the one-to-one -one personal perspective, but we've connected that. Uh, we recognize this person has visited our landing page from a third-party site, and now she's within our own channel. Um, but we also have been to do some deeper background work on her as well, being that she's an existing customer. So we connected her third-party kind of learning journey to she's an existing customer, high-value customer, and through... Um, MarTech, whether it be you know our DMP and other um, data and insights and modeling that we are able to do, we determine that she is uh, eligible for even a richer premium offer. So we present that to her when she gets to uh, our, our authenticated site, um, and that is the motivation for her to click through and apply. Engagement starts at new account opening, and so. Um, you know, the sales cycle isn't completed just because the consumer could, you know, applied and then got approved for our card. It's always about what's that next best action for that customer to take to be further uh, educated and provide deeper levels of awareness into our core card program. So we enable the, an interaction to go to our rewards platform um, so she can immediately begin to learn how do points work for her. Um, and so as we think about an omni-channel marketing campaign, you know, connecting third-party digital to own channel digital, uh, and then carrying that through to uh, early month on book. So like her, her first, in, you know, kind of engagement with us is now learning about rewards, which deeply ties to her original behavior, which is she wants to travel and she wants to leverage um, you know, points rewards to enable that feature. And so we do deep levels of analysis, like I was showing on the previous slide with evaluating the scale and you know, evaluating the, the wants and needs of consumers to ultimately get to a frictionless customer experience where we take the guesswork out of um, you know, the customer and provide them with you know, opportunities and, and insights to uh, interact with us based off of their uh, their wants and needs. And so when we look at how we, you know, typically go to market, it's typically with a 360 degree marketing approach, you know, through the Mount Line media strategy, ensuring that we are relevant uh, at different stages of the funnel, whether it be awareness or, you know, driving consumers into consideration and intent, um, ultimately to conversion. 
um, is our, our, our overall goal. And then I just got to have an examples of media platforms that we would typically leverage depending on our overall campaign goals. Um, so, so some of the channels, it's not all of, we, we know we don't drive like direct accounts in some of the channels, um, you know, paid social is a good example or even programmatic display and addressable TV, but those are channels that are meant to, to ensure that we, we interject ourselves along the way of the consumer journey so that um, consumers aren't just informed of our products. And so by the time they are ready to apply for a card, they have that, oh yeah, there's a product that I saw that's out there from Wells Fargo. And whether they come to our website or whether they go to uh, a, a paid search engine, um, you know, they ha they may have in mind Wells Fargo credit card. It may not be the specific product, but the the value of being you know relevant and present in channels along the consumer journey is um, invaluable, actually. And and I know that this this funnel looks linear, so you know it looks like people, consumers go from awareness to intent. Um, and consideration to conversion, and that's not always the case. Uh, you know, I think it's more of a loop or a journey. So we ensure that we have an effective media mix to uh, capture where consumers are in their learning journey, and uh, ensure that we're we're always present and relevant along the way. And and along with that, you know, how do we stand out against the competition? There are some key areas of focus. So again, this is a more of a uh, a very dense, uh, I would say, content dense page. But I would just say um, areas of focus for us are the rich value. So ensure and rich value could be um, we're on par with certain components of the card program, but um, you know, in, in more tangible value in areas that consumers can easily identify. And we bring that out in our messaging, we bring that out in the overall application experience so that we stand out. And, and, and again, it's critical for us to have a more uh, connected approach. I think uh, there have been times where we've even ourselves gotten caught up in silos and you know the direct the offline channel thinks about offline and third party digital thinks about a third party digital and and own channel teams think about own channel and there's no connected experience and um, and so we obsess over connecting the journey just so we appear as one Wells Fargo to consumers across um, both digital and offline channels. And what that earns us is a superior customer experience, um, optimized investments, which is critical. Um, if they're underperforming digital or offline channels, we look to optimize our mix to where we are driving the uh, you, you know, the performance according to our KPIs by each of the channels and more engaged customers. So I, I think that that is ultimately the holy grail is really not just to drive conversions, but ultimately uh, I, I find extreme satisfaction is when consumers get our products and they use them and they're happy with them. And so um, standing out against the competition, these are the areas that we typically focus. And then I would just say in summary, uh, what does it take to deliver exceptional digital marketing campaigns? Um, it, just to ensure that you have a connected marketing strategy centered around the customer, um, avoid the silos uh, as best as possible. Um, I know that many organizations were all, you were trained to be sort of entrepreneurs and run our channels like we own them, but we have to have more of a shared model because it's about the enterprise and not just our individual channels. Um, and ensure that um, as you build your, your segments, leveraging demographic and psychographic profile data, that um, you've got, you're ensuring that your brand is the right fit for the target audience and you've got appropriate scales. So you um, meet the expected business goals. And standing out against the competition, um, we, uh, again, obsess over that because we know we have not only in industry competition, but the outside of our vertical uh, consumer experience expectations have been set. And so we know we have to have frictionless digital experiences. Um, and the superior experience is actually table stakes. It's not something that we think about as an our afterthought. And, and measure and optimize and iterate. If you're not measuring, you're not marketing, 
Um, and so we look at data and insights to consistently optimize our programs. We, we've gone away from big releases and, um, you know, long-term kind of data and insights and, and then go into big releases to more iterative, always on small insights and, and constantly excelling and, and improving on our marketing and on our customer experience. And what you could expect to do that if you're good and you're lucky is, um, you know, more customers and, and, and more customers who turn into your brand ambassadors. Thanks, Brian. That was awesome. Next up is Brenda with Marketing Thoughtfully and Effectively in a Pandemic. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, um, really, I'm going to switch a, a little bit in what we're talking about here. Uh, it is an omni-channel approach that we did take when, we, when COVID became um, uh, an issue here in the U.S. Um, the bank did set up a command center, cross-functional command center, uh, where it was all of the disciplines throughout the bank, um, some top leaders uh, ended up coming together and really forming a team that then all communication and all, um, you know, advertising and everything else, PR, all went through the command center so that we had one um, source of truth uh, throughout the whole company. Uh, of course, in March, I think a lot of companies, as well as ours, moved as many employees as possible to work from home status. Um, and really, the company had a large emphasis on employee care. So it was all about, you know, how do we care for our clients, but also how do we care for our employees? And then um, implementing ongoing internal and external communication plans. So part of what the command center did was set up uh, very robust omni-channel, um, ongoing internal and external plans um, for disseminating information and so on. Uh, we focused on programs that offered relief and support for the customers. So the customer was always first in everything that the company did. Um, and, you know, how can we help you uh, was a big theme. And then we... We're working to increase our DIY or do-it-yourself um, capabilities throughout the bank. We were probably at about a 40 or 50% um, average on people doing it themselves online. And we increased that speed to market. So we spun up um, specific teams directly related to being able to do things that you would normally do in a branch um, online instead, and we're able to turn those products and um, services uh, pretty quickly uh, after everybody was sent home. So those are some of the, the main responses that we had. Um, on the next slide, you'll see exactly, you know, what our, how we pivoted the marketing strategy. So uh, we did build um, a COVID-19 uh, landing page on usbank.com. It really standardized the communication across all of the different channels, uh, as well as um, we did do a hub and communication through our app. Uh, we paused all promotional emails um, and really shifted our search, our marketing, so search, social, um, email, and so on, into communicating changes in the branch status, supporting local and small businesses, thanking frontline employees. Um, and our brand campaign really shifted to focus on our community support response efforts, uh, which was donating a $30 million um, grant to our communities in need. And so what we did with that was we took um, that and made it into more of a brand message that, you know, where community support and brand messaging equaled um, impactful communication stories that we were then able to go out in an omnichannel way and communicate to the public. And so one of the themes was, uh, we can't thank you enough. We can do our part. And that's why we donate million, donated billions um, to communities in need. So uh, it was a message around thanking our frontline employees as well as all those frontline employees that were you know, doing their part, thanking people for staying home and you know, telling them exactly how we were helping uh, within our communities. So some of the other things that we did um, were use things like QR codes and printed materials to encourage banking from home. This, you know, this is part of that do-it-yourself um, idea. 
uh, to, you know, really encourage our client, our customers to be able to do that. Product marketing invested more in digital channels and platforms has increased their online presence. And then uh, customer communication increased messaging to keep customers informed how we, you know, how our hours were changing, what branches were closing, um, alternatives to going into the branch, you know, what does that online presence look like? Um, and, you know, part of the way that we did that was by changing, say, our, our Google My Business profile, where we changed our hours or put messaging out um, specific to COVID or, you know, that type of thing. Uh, was able to help us with that, which was great. And then um, we have a big social responsibility um, area within the bank. And, you know, we use that to... So provide another five billion in immediate grant uh, relief grants, um, which deployed in March, and we got a lot of earned media stories from that particular um, relief as well. So some of the things that we found uh, as far as learning uh, with the audience and, and just how we were marketing were business actions today will shape corporate reputation for years to come. So what we communicated out to the public and how we um, helped our clients uh, does shape uh, how they think of us in years to come. And it's not business as usual, so don't communicate like it is. Uh, we pulled back on a lot of our promotional product types of communication and really focused on communities and um, our, you know, our clients and how we could help them and the relief programs that we offered and so on. And then customers have um, increased their use of drive through mobile app, online banking, and we feel that the digital management um, will sustain post-COVID. So we're probably going to see um, a bit of a shift in how our consumers actually interact with us. And so, you know, some of the things that we had to look at and, you know, the ways in which we adjusted our brand campaign is, you know, the world is in a state of confusion and uncertainty. There's social distancing and quarantining and, and you know, communities and nonprofits are suffering and people on the front lines just keep our country going. And so um, what we did was, you know, we have tools to, um, at the bank where we can help you and, you know, we'll donate to, to the communities in need and so on. So that's just, you know, how we um, adjusted a little bit there and what we did with our messaging. So looking normal, um, the things that, you know, we're going to be carrying forward as strategies and tactics and so on um, are staying true to our core values and brand. Uh, one of the core values of the bank is ethics and we do the right thing. And so, um, you know, by helping out communities in need and by thanking people along the way. I think that that, you know, helped us make the core values of the brand. And we'll continue that in our storytelling and so on uh, as to how those funds were used. Um, senior executive communication, PR efforts really did play an important um, external role um, as well as internal role for our employee base. And so, um, you know, those, types of PR efforts and, and external communications are going to continue. Um, we will continue brand advertising for long-term impact. Uh, we have started some um, product advertising, but we really haven't gone heavy duty into it at this point, just because we feel that um, it's more impactful to you know, stay with this type of messaging. Uh, for the for the short term, at least right now, and it just increase our market that brand message. And then customers want to hear what brands are doing to support um, community, and they really do appreciate advertising and messaging around this. Uh, you saw a lot of brands, I think, come out with just how they're helping in their communities and what they're doing for their customers and so on. And I think that that's just the, the general theme right now. Um, and then. We do anticipate a continued digital engagement um, going forward, and the bank is, is working very hard on that DIY um, strategy and making things easier for our clients online, um, really taking everything that you could do in the branch and moving it into the online space. Um, and those will be ongoing efforts uh, as they go through this year.
All right, Brenda, thank you so much. I told you we had some, uh, we had some research information to share with you. And uh, the first finding is a, a benchmark on the technical use of schemas. And 64% of the financial customers that we surveyed, and there's about 200, 250 uh, banks and financial in this um, panel, uh, that they were not using schemas. Now, the industry overall does use schemas, and 19% of the sample was using advanced schemas, which makes it the most uh, kind of aggressive of all the industries using it. But disappointingly, 70% of those are, who are using uh, schemas uh, are showing errors. So when you have errors, you sort of negate the opportunity to communicate and signal to Google for where, where what this entity is and where it goes in the knowledge graph. The mobile speed score at 39 was similar to other industries, but kind of a, this is disappointingly low, I think, for an industry that is kind of well-funded, you know, large and well-funded. And it's definitely an opportunity. Um, I, Everybody in the audience, you guys should be targeting 80, 90, you know, 80 plus mobile speed score. And there's been some changes recently on how they're deriving speed score. But if you look at the subcomponents, how fast is the page loading? They're really trying to get at the user experience. Now, 97% of the sites we looked at are not using AMP. And AMP is, has been around a while, about five years. And it is a really powerful opportunity to increase the speed. And it's not the only way to increase speed, but it's Google's recipe for creating pages that load that load quickly and it gives you the AMP marker in the mobile search results. And what we see is pretty consistently 15 to 25% more page views. So we see more, we see new arrivals, we see a, a different group of people coming in mobile, and then we see them using more page views because they're loading faster and they have really good engagement on the site. And I'm even seeing conversion, mobile conversion, which you know, on my B2B site and B2B customers, you don't usually expect a, a lot of performance from directly from mobile. But uh, we see that with AMP because the experience is enhanced for people who really want to use that device. So if you guys want a copy of this, you can go to, go to, go to gomilestone.com industry benchmarks. All of my research reports are in the uh, ebooks and white papers section of the resources uh, section of my website. Now here's two new uh, research reports that are kind of digging deeper on the impact of schemas and AMP specifically. And then the first one's a benchmark. The first one I just showed you is a benchmark, but schemas like do schemas work? And schemas have been around for 10 years now. And is the juice worth the squeeze? And this research definitively shows it, it is worth the squeeze. And I think Brenda's gonna be able to comment a little bit on that when we get to the panel discussion on, on what you see. So for, you know, tens and tens, you know, hundreds, it's hundreds of hours of work to do advanced schemas, but you, we see increase in visibility, rich media results in the SERPs, uh, impressions, traffic arrivals, and, uh, and all of that leads to better um, performance on whatever conversion metric uh, our customers are looking at. Now, AMP also, we, we did a similar measure of AMP, does it work? And in order to create AMP sites, you, you AMP pages, you create alternate versions of the, the existing page with the AMP markup. And when the device, when, when Google sees that the device is mobile and it'll, it'll pull the AMP page instead, the person will enter on the AMP page and then um, they can go from an AMP page to non-AMP pages on that experience. But the more AMP pages you have, the more it's connected and fast for them to move through your website. And what we see with uh, the AMP increases speed, core vitals, and specifically a big increase on the CLS, which is the, um, the content layout shift, which is the content moving around if the page is unsettled. And if you're on a mobile phone, it's particularly bad to have things move around because you touch the wrong thing with your finger and end up in the wrong spot. So Google has been essentially rewarding sites that are getting that CLS score down and AMP pages have much better CLS than uh, sites that don't use AMP. Rank, traffic, and revenue all increase with AMP. So if you want to see this research, there's the URL. We will be sending out the, uh, the, the deck and the video to, uh, to all the attendees and registrants. So if you want to sign up for a free performance audit, so the first 10 of you, these take us a while to put together. So if you would like us to look at your schemas, your AMP, your speed, your SEO, your technical SEO, and your ADA conformance, we will do that for you for free for the first 10 that register. 
gomilestoneinternet.com slash audit. All right, so uh, I've really enjoyed uh, preparing the content uh, with uh, Brenda and Brian on this. And just to remind you of the things that each of us cares about together and kind of separately, understanding your customer. That if you don't, if you don't really, if you're not understanding what your customer needs, you're just creating kind of junk, junk uh, digital content and junk experience. Um, you got to connect the dots between your channels, your content, and your colleagues. If you're not breaking down the silos, you're not really going to have an integrated experience. I learned from Brenda's content that you can manage and enhance your brand even in a crisis. I don't think that was everybody's first instinct. I think everybody's first instinct was, oh God, like we have to change so many things. And U.S. Bank, like from its principles and it's, you know, it's, it's recognized in the industry for being consistent at that. They didn't jump on it as an opportunity. The crisis was an opportunity to extend something they'd already been doing, which is really kind of good, clear-headed, medium-term, long-term brand management and uh, really commendable and uh, kind of, you know, inspiring. Um, the crisis will accelerate digital transformation. All, all three of us spoke about how that's going to be happening, how much more important uh, digital channels are going to be. And that, um, you know, my point, my key takeaway that I want to leave you with was that the Google is the homepage of all your homepages across the internet. And you need to get that content right on your, uh, with schemas, with AMP, with speed, with experience, with crawlability, with visibility. And that's how, you know, you're going to communicate to Google that this is like, this is valuable authoritative content. So that is it for our prepared material. We can take questions now if you have come in already. So Brenda, um, how have you used schemas and to what result for US Bank? We use Milestone to provide our schemas and made it so that they just are applied to the different pages um, through a tagging system. Uh, and we've seen about a 30% increase in rich um, media uh, results based on the fact that um, Engage, you know, Milestone in helping us with that schema project. Awesome. Uh, a question from Harmit. Did uh, both Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank have any other way of implementing schema before, before the projects you're talking about now? Did you, did, you have a, did you have a prior implementation or did you start with the one you mentioned, Brenda? We did it all hand. So it was within the CMS. And it just wasn't scalable. Right. I would say for us, I have to confirm how. I'm not sure if it's by hand or if we have a tool in place. So, um, Eric, I'll, I'll just let you know. Maybe you could just inform the audience of how we manage Yeah, things. sure. We'll, we'll follow up later with, uh, with what, what's been tried so far. Sure. All right, a question from Megan. Hi, Brian, great info. Could you talk about some tips on how your digital team prevents the siloing and any tools in your marketing stack you suggest for insights on conversion optimization? Sure, I'll start with conversion optimization. So we are you know, big believers of um, GA, uh, Google Analytics premium version. Um, it, and, and I think with uh, some of the recent enhancements in terms of the query, uh, from Google, so, so so sort of Google Stack, uh, we're able to take in data from multiple channels and analyze interrelationship, and then um, you know come up with insights into how we can further improve. Preventing silos is is very difficult. I mean, we spend a lot of time fighting against bureaucracy, um, and so and I define that as there are competing entities in the organization that have different ideas. Um, uh, in, in different ways that they, they want to accomplish things. And, and that just means as an organization, we're not connected. So we really spend a lot of time obsessing about goals and objectives. Um, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And how will we do it? And how will we measure it? Um, and so we get a, our, our organization aligned around overall goals and objectives, first and foremost. And then we collaborate on how do we bring our channels together. And so we, we are literally forced to present um, holistic plans to senior leadership just to show that this is our, our kind of cross-channel customer experience that we recommend. Brenda, what, um, can you talk a little bit more about how you used local and GMB posts during the crisis and, and how many branches and what was the complexity and the management issue associated with um, different messaging by branch? Sure. Um, I 
just so that you know, my phone is going a little in and out, so uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, the, we have about 5,000 um, different properties that we were managing at the time uh, that were ATMs and branches. And, um, part of what we did was just work with Milestone in aggregating a lot of that closure data and, and so on out there, our changes, you know, what drive ups were open, which ones weren't, and so on. And we're still doing that today. Um, and then we also used um, like FAQ areas and um, just comment areas and so on within GMB to provide you know, specific instruction for our clients, um, specifically in the areas where you know, the branches were closed or you know, those types of things. Um, so it was, it was a fairly complex um, process and uh, we are still actually uh, working on it today. There are still branches closed and lobbies closed and so on, and it shifts on a pretty regular basis. Thank you. Brian, uh, what are the priorities in planning omni-channel campaigns? Yeah, I think the main priority is just to ensure that we understand uh, the unique uh, purpose or, or, or area of expertise for each channel. Um, so like social is very relational. Um, and so you've got to come off like pure and authentic. And so how do we leverage social to deliver our message differently, say, from programmatic display um, and, and then differently from paid search, which is a catch all channel. So if, if somebody comes to search, they already have a certain level of information about your product. And so we think about um, search as more of a, a, a conversion channel. And and how do we ensure that like our you know metadata is is right in terms of the SEO links and and our ad copy is the right level of information to drive that click through. And so we, uh, you know, just have a deep understanding of each channel, each purpose of each channel and how they um, interplay off of each other to be relevant in the appropriate part of the consumer journey to apply. Right. Thank you. Uh, Brenda, do you have any advice for banks who are earlier on their digital journeys? You know, obviously, U.S. Bank is very mature in what it's doing, but there's a lot of regional banks who are probably in the audience. What, 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 what to tackle first? There's, it's, it's the, there's a lot to get to where you got with that saturated serve. Where I would probably start is uh, both a localized campaign. So you'd want to pick up your local search, um, you know, specific to your branches, specific to your location, um, and then uh, make sure that your product really marked up well with schema mm -hmm. and um you know make sure that you've got a kind of a q a type of um situation happening to be picked up for those rich snippets and and so on so that it can work in conjunction with your schema great thank you so a question just came in from harmit what's next for wells fargo and u.s bank after schema so brenda we'll start with you i think i know which one you i think i know what you've got in mind but uh, what's on the radar <laughs> there's a couple things we're working a lot on voice uh, so we're working on um, putting together voice actions and you know uh, really pushing the voice side of the equation we are also working on a proof of concept for amp so that's something that the bank is um, looking at, you know, but we really, before we go full force into it, we want to understand what the value there is. I would say What's similar, it's the same thing. We, we are working on mobile optimization, um, page load. So improving the content on how the, the, the pages are presented on, on a, within our mobile experience, and, and then also evaluating AMP um, to see what value it delivers. Awesome. Um, Brian, what are the pitfalls of omni-channel marketing? What are the learnings? You've been, you've been at this, I think, for almost a decade at Wells, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, um, I've been at Wells for five years, and prior oh. to that, I was at Chase for 14 years. Yeah. Um, I, I would just say, you know, pitfalls, really going back to, like, the silo way of thinking um, and, and not connecting the customer experience in more of a journey way. Um, and, and so thinking about offline channels and digital channels um, and how there needs to be a level of consistency and tone 
and and content. Uh, but then also, you know, being flexible enough, and, and you mentioned this earlier too, Eric, being flexible enough to ensure that you appear appropriately in the channel. So I can't think about, um, you know, online video the exact same way that I do, um, you know, like a, a static ad on um, Facebook or Instagram. So I've got a design for the platform, for the medium. Uh, to be relevant and effective. And then I've got to have the right KPIs. I would say also ensure you've got the right KPIs across the journey. So um, one of the pitfalls that we try to uh, educate the organization against is looking at every channel in the same way uh, in terms of conversions, cost per accounts. Some, the, the CPAs are much higher because they're awareness channels. And so I think when you properly educate your organization on how they should be measuring um, each part of the consumer journey, um, you'll, you'll be winning. Great, thanks, Brian. Uh, Brenda, do you, ha you have experience with uh, FAQ as a content type and, with a, and combined with schema? Do you guys roll out FAQs? Yep, uh, we do have FAQs throughout um, all of our websites that is marked up via schema. Um, and then we are also working on just those voice actions, which are written just slightly differently um, in a more conversational tone and um, being able to push those out to Google as well. Fantastic. Uh, any results you can share with us on FAQs? Um, yeah, we actually just started um, pushing those pretty heavily here with the last months. So we haven't, you know, we've seen some really nice upticks. Um, in just those, you know, results, but, um, you know, I don't have anything quantifiable specific to the FAQs. Okay, great. I want to thank you guys both so much for coming. This was a fantastic webinar. I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed the Q&A discussion and your content. I want to thank the audience for joining us here today and uh, look forward to uh, sharing this content and more content that we develop for the finance industries. Thanks so much.